Good afternoon, everybody. I assume you're watching this on Friday afternoon or later. And uh, the goal is it has been each week now for a couple of weeks is for you to watch this prior to gathering uh, in our simple churches on Sunday morning at 930. Um, the goal is really to give you the food for thought and uh, the, the big ideas and uh, the, the, the things to reflect on uh, in this video format so that you can watch it one or several times and then come together on Sunday morning in the simple churches more for the purpose of relating to one another, sharing, uh, eating together and uh, praying as well as having the discussion around um, probably one significant idea here. Um, not a lot we can accomplish in one hour, but hopefully with this combination of things of, of this teaching online and uh, your gathering together, we can, uh, we can really try to hold to those habits that we saw and talked about in the early church in Acts where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking bread, the fellowship, and prayer. We're trying to practice all of those things as best we can uh, given the realities of the situation that we're in. So I hope everybody's had a good week and uh, you're staying safe and dry with the storm that's coming uh, sometime Friday night, um, hurricane or I guess tropical storm today they're calling it. So awful early this year, but uh, hopefully it's not a portent of uh, things to come. But let me take into the, uh, the slide set that I have uh, prepared today just to uh, orient us to this and uh, you should be able to see that um, in the video and I'll keep my video up so you can see me speaking so it's not just a, a faceless voice there um, but um, a couple orienting things one I've mentioned uh, this book to you last week as parents um, encourage you to get that and just to understand uh, this moralistic therapeutic deism idea that I talked about last week that as a prevalent cultural norm among um, evangelicals in general and what's being uh, what's being taught and transferred to our kids uh, either intentionally or unintentionally uh, mostly unintentionally so what it does is just helps you create a, an awareness of, uh, of what's going on culturally we've um, slid into as a culture a cultural form of Christianity that's not produced uh, a challenge and a strength to our kids to pursue the faith it's made it optional if not really irrelevant to the changing world around them and there's a whole lot of other factors but um, I say that because uh, uh, your intentionality and what your your the emphasis that you give as home as parents in things like praying together and opening God's word together in talking together um, in, in showing your interest and engagement in these things with the kids is very, very important to lay in those foundations. If you're not doing those things, you're contributing to moralistic therapeutic deism in their kids. It's something that matters to you, but doesn't necessarily have to matter to them. So think about being intentional about these things. And one of the tools that we provide for you is uh, the tool that uh, rooted in Proverbs. Again, something that can be used very easily with the small children, but you'll need to plan it into your day and plan the time and make it a habit, same time every day, same place. Um, and that habit, as it catches on, will have its own effect, even in relation to the teaching that you'll see today. Um, it's part of uh, the, an the antidote to this idea of moralistic therapeutic deism. We'll be praying on uh, Wednesday evening from seven to eight breaking up often into two or three groups so we can pray in a little more uh, detail for one another, two or three people together. And we can do that now on the computer where I break everybody up into a number of groups that um, gives you some time to do that. So we're very, uh, we try to keep very much on time, eight, uh, seven to eight o'clock. So uh, you can plan your day or your evening around that. So please take advantage of that. And even if you can't be there for the full time, it's good just to have everybody check in. Um, it, even if you're out and about somewhere, pull Zoom up on your phone and uh, check in with us and say hello. Um, that's that's a real blessing to have everybody do that. My my goal is that everybody who would be on Sunday would pop in and be present for some or part of the time on Wednesday night. Um, and again, that's that's something that we have to decide to do um, and uh, and make it a priority. So I encourage you in that. And uh, we'll be continuing the 
video teaching on uh, Thursday night this week. It's going to be on the Messiah, um, a very important theme that we'll be talking about. So a Tuesday email will go out to everybody. And um, then on Thursday night at 7, we'll get together on Zoom and watch the video and discuss it um, after you've done some reflection and, and note taking and um, um, just tried to capture your thoughts about it beforehand. A little relaxed. I've got my coffee here uh, sharing with you. Um, I mentioned last week a special event that's coming up on the 26th, the Fellowship of Churches that I grew up in and has had some participation with us with Nick at Night and the churches of that fellowship have had groups and teens uh, and college, uh, uh, college and high school groups come here and stay with us. Um, they're having an online event that you might all be encouraged by uh, on Sunday night, July 26 at 6 p.m. So you can watch it. It's not like our Zooms where you'll be able to interact, but it's more like watching, you know, a TV show or a, 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 a live stream. And it can be found there at weareone.video at um, 6 p.m. on the 26th. So just encourage you to take advantage of that if you're um, um, wanting to uh, to be encouraged in uh, in what's going on in the wider um, wider uh, Christian community and uh, one that is uh, it directly affects us through my connections with that fellowship and uh, um, many that we know through that uh, process. Um, I'm going to continue the teaching from where we started, really going back into the beginning of this whole uh, situation in March, but laying the groundwork for what uh, not only was happening historically in the early church, but what they were teaching and what they were developing. How is that plan, the story that we have from the New Testament and the, the elements like the teaching and uh, the writings of the apostles that, and the work they were doing form us today and shape who we are and what we're doing. Um, and especially given the fact that we're in this situation where we're not meeting as we traditionally are, but yet we look back at the early church and say, well, they didn't meet that way either. They met in homes and, and groups around the city and uh, they all functioned as their own, as churches. And they did all the things that we're doing and they had relationships uh, close relationships with one another and leaders moved around among them. And that's how the church existed in, for 300 years. And it didn't just exist. It grew explosively. Um, and you could imagine in our world today, if this becomes a regular occurrence, what if we have a COVID crisis like this every two years? Um, we could still, and we should still expand and multiply as a church. Um, and uh, what it means for us to plant churches is to plant groups like the simple churches that are gathering this weekend. Um, that's what a church plant looks like. It's not building a building and getting a staff and uh, putting together programs and having a Sunday service. It's leaders who are gathering people together like you're doing on Sunday and following the things and the patterns. Of them. That's what a church plant looks like from the perspective of the New Testament. Uh, and the teaching that we're talking about now and how it rolled out to them and, and the, 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 the variety of categories from individual to the wider world are, were very important in shaping their identity and their purpose together. And so that's what we're doing uh, in this time and focusing on that uh, ourselves together. So um, again, just a reminder, we are a family of families. That's our core identity, who worship and follow Jesus as Lord by learning to think and live wisely by his spirit together so that we can impact our city and world in the way of Christ and his apostles. I hope, think, I hope you'll reflect on this from time to time and think through what each one of these things means. Um, our identity, our purpose, um, how we go about that, uh, our emphasis on learning together and, and with the effort of, of wisely uh, living those things out together um, so that we can make a difference in Clifton. We can make a difference in the three cities of Pet Clifton, Patterson, Passaic, uh, in North Jersey, in our partnerships around the world. I was just online with the Ukraine team again this morning. They send their greetings with one of our leaders in Kosovo. Again, we're engaging in significant things that we're able to 
um, connect with because they're the same kinds of things we need to be doing here. Um, following the apostles teaching, following Jesus's plan from the new Testament and um, connecting with and, and learning from and, and, helping even to train leaders and churches in other places to do the same thing. So we want to work hard in our own situation so that it, there's a good example and um, that will open up opportunities uh, in, in other places that we're, uh, we'll have, we have connections with or that op doors of opportunities will open up to. So I wanted to look today at this idea of the new life of virtue. Last year we looked at, or last week we looked at the, the new self or the new man being new creation as one of the things very early on in our Christian experience, we need to grasp and, and understand we are no longer the person that we were before because of our faith in Jesus and what he has done for us and the giving of his spirit. We have a new identity um, and we need to learn to understand fully what that identity is. It's an identity, it's a gift that's given from God. It's not an identity we form, it's an identity that's given to us into which we need to learn to grow. And uh, not just in a theoretical sense, but also in a practical sense. And we often, if not always, act out of our identity. Who we are uh, determines what we do or who we think we are determines what we do. And that leads to this next step, which is also another, or the second in the, in the think about the apostles' teachings is the rungs of a ladder, uh, climbing towards maturity or wisdom. Uh, and the second rung of the ladder here is a life of virtue, a life where we put on virtue. And so that's what we want to talk about uh, today and in our simple churches on Sunday. Um, Ephesians 1, uh, 4, 1 to 16 gives us a full picture of the church. Um, you can read through these. I met, talked about it last week, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on it. But again, Jesus is building a global church, and he's building, uh, he wants every church to be a strategic church, and some more than others. But um, this is not optional teaching for um, us because of where we live or when we are living or where we come from. This is the the pattern, the teaching that was handed on to the church for all time. But when you think about our life and your life as an individual Christian, uh, here's the question, and I want you to think about it. What is your task as an individual follower of Jesus in this time between your turning to Jesus and belief in baptism and either his return or you're going to be with him before your future resurrection? Now we're thinking about the big span of time. You've, you've embraced the gospel, You've said you believe that uh, God has a, a plan for you. He loves you. He's uh, made every opportunity through Jesus and his dying in your place and rising to new life uh, to give you new life and new hope for the future. Um, that by that, you're, you're placing your confidence in that and you're um, affirming your loyal allegiance to him in baptism. And that's essentially what you're doing. I am part of Jesus and I am part of his people. Um, I'm, I'm declaring my allegiance and my, my, my loyalty here. Um, with that event in your past, or maybe for some of you, it's still ahead in your future, but you're in the process towards it and you need to make progress towards that. Beyond that is Jesus's return for our dying and going to be with him, looking forward to the day when he comes again and brings our spirit and reunites us with a resurrected body and we all live in the new heavens and the new earth. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to be doing? What, what should we be focused on between that conversion experience and the future fulfillment of all things? What are we supposed to be doing between now and then? Um, that's an important question. Um, because God doesn't just snatch us away when we're saved or when we turn to him and, uh, and are saved, or um, he doesn't change everything. We still, you know, a lot of things still remain the same for us. So what's it all about? Um, and I add today's topic into this foundational statement that we drew from Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, because we're now part of God's vision 
for the church only because of what Jesus has done in his life, death, and resurrection, and now by his spirit in us. So God's taking the initiative, and he's accomplished it all in Jesus. Um, it's a gift that he's uh, offered to us and inviting us to be a part of. We are then, in response to that, we are to grow to maturity by pursuing virtues to become able to build up others in the body and the family of Christ so that God's wisdom will shine through us and point everyone to the future renewal of all things. Pursuing virtues. That's the emphasis uh, for today. Um, again, this is part and parcel with the goal that Jesus had for his early followers as we see as we saw last week, that Jesus made it a central part of his ministry to instruct his disciples in the life God intended men and women to live. For example, the Sermon on the Mount and the Last Supper Discourse, John 13 through 17, essentially, and uh, other places. But the apostles and the early church leaders made it a central part of their pastoral work to hand on and explain this instruction. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writers of the New Testament passed on this teaching to the church for all time. It forms the measuring rod for determining the soundness of Christian lives. So does the apostles teaching have anything to do with developing in virtue uh, and pursuing virtue? It does. And I hope that is very, very clear today. And what that is and how we pursue that. There is so much to talk about in this topic. But I'll point you to some resources and probably even send a video that you can um, watch on YouTube that will go explain this even deeper based on a book that I'll share with you in a minute. But let me ask this question. What do you think of when you hear the word virtue? What is it and why is it or is it not significant for today's world? It's not a word we use much. It's not a subject we talk about much, but it is very much at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this time between the baptism and the funeral, uh, if I can put it in those terms. Um, your pursuit of virtues is absolutely crucial to being in a place where you can build Christ church and do all sorts of other things, but primarily that. One of the ways to think about virtues is uh, by, by, by in the nature of this. Many of you might remember this. I don't remember what year it was. It's referred to in the book that I talked about later, but the miracle on the Hudson. And um, in fact, um, in the book that I'll present to you in a little bit, it's argued that it's not a miracle. This was not a miracle that happened. This was a matter of a 30-year trained pilot who, in a moment of crisis, and when in a matter of seconds made a thousand little decisions that had all been uh, made over and over again over a period of 30 years, there was no need to consult a manual. There was no need to call anyone. He made a set of quick decisions that led to the safety uh, and, and survival of all the people who were on board. Not anyone was lost. And indeed, even the plane was recovered. Why? He knew what to do on the thousand and one time to do it because he had already done it in his mind and in practicality a thousand times. He had been trained to, to make the decision when it counted. The argument is that there was a strength of character and coolness and calmness and poise in the midst of adversity that lots of a lifetime of work had led up to. How and why would we think that it is any different for us as Christians in being able to live in the challenges of a world right now that's turning upside down? What we need is the strength of Christian character that's developed by the pursuit of virtues. And that's what we'll talk about in uh, particularly the focus on uh, a key passage, a couple passages, but one that we are very familiar with that talks about these things. Um, Think about this in light of the moralistic therapeutic deism idea that you talked about you last week, that is now the, the fake version of Christianity that's been created in particularly American culture. Um, does it produce the kind of character and particularly the kind of fruit uh, in, in a virtuous life that we're looking at here? Um, is it full blown? Is it really, really um, what we're looking at here? It, it, there's a, the proof is in the pudding. 
um, if moralistic de therapeutic deism works as a worldview and as a and as a and as a and as a way of living, then it ought to be on par with the virtues of the Christian life, and it's not. Um, I gave you definitions of this last week. That here's a summary from the book Almost Christian that I mentioned earlier. That it's basically these things, things that aren't necessarily distinct among people whether you're a Christian or not, there are a lot of non-Christians and even non-Christian uh, religions or so-called Christian religions or, or traditions that believe these things. There's a, there's a God who, cre who cre existed and created the orders of the world, watches over life on earth. Well, the, the Greeks kind of even believe that, and that, that this even traces back to that, you know. Um, a God up there, but not really or, or gods, not really interested in life and work. They set things in motion, but we're kind of left here to run it. God wants people to good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. So the goal is being a nice person, you know, by and large. And uh, you might be have some strengths and weaknesses, but aren't we all that way? But if we can just get along well, we're okay. There's no real higher calling to being a human being than that. And the Bible's calling in terms of the virtuous life and the kind of character we're to have is far beyond this. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Um, that's very different from the central goal of life being one of strong character um, who knows what to do in every and any circumstances in a way that would be um, looking forward to and rooted back in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It's an affirmation of who God is and what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. And that shows itself up in the character formation of uh, a person who is a follower of Christ. And think about character as the kinds of things that you would do regardless of what ever anybody else was look, watching or not. Moralistic therapeutic deism is a lot about my standing in, in social structures and my standing with others. Hence, people can be one thing on Facebook and something very else in reality. A person of character is the same no matter if they're on social media or if they're at home alone um, watching television or reading a book or doing other things. They're the same across both of those things. They're authentic and true, and they're truly free because they do that now by second nature. They don't have to think about it and work about it. They've been trained over time. One of the passages that I haven't brought in, but is very appropriate here is Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, who people have been trained and develop skill and wisdom, skill and living by, um, you know, discerning and able to discern between good and evil um, and, and have and, and trained themselves that way. And that's part and parcel with this idea of developing a virtuous life, a life of character. God's not involved in my life except when I need God to resolve a problem. So I'm pretty much free to do whatever I need to do. And I can call God in when I need him, but I'm pretty much up able to design and, and shape my own life. And character is what I make of it or what I want of it or what my culture tells me it needs to be. Um, so God is sort of left outside or at least on the sidelines and good people go to heaven when they die. So that's really the end goal, whatever I need to do to get there. And if character gets me there, well, that's might be good for me, but others might think that there are other, other ways to pursue that. And what exactly is good? Who defines that? Um, and that might be different for different people. So you can see how, uh, how different this is, I hope by, in comparison, what the the virtues of the Christian life are, and, and virtues that don't, again, um, and I'll say that hopefully say this several times, they don't happen automatically. They have to be developed, but we don't develop them on our own. We have the help and the agency and the enablement of the Spirit, and we have other people in our lives, our families, and our church family that help us to do this. But we need to take responsibility for the developing of strong Christian character and pursuing virtues. Uh, that's a key thing I hope that you'll remember from today's um, sharing, uh, today's teaching. Galatians 5 is where we get to the heart of this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so 
just stop here and look at a couple of things. The life of the led by the spirit, the life led by the flesh. Flesh being our corruptible nature, our uh, fallible nature, our brokenness. Um, that is not compatible with, one, with the new creation that we are, what we saw last week, and the future that the Spirit of God is leading us towards. We need to live now as people of the future, people of new creation, and what God is doing and going to do completely and fully in the world. Um, so, and what we have here is not an argument between keeping rules or not keeping rules. We're not talking about that either, and we'll look at that here in a minute. Um, we're talking about a life that uh, is fits with what the Spirit is called us to do and is is leading us to do, and working alongside Him towards His ends in building a people uniquely set apart for God that are consistent with the new creation that's begun in Jesus and will fully be realized when he returns. He goes on to say the works of the flesh, the works of our corruptibility and our brokenness are evident. We see these all around us in a variety of ways, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, and that can mean a number of things. There are a number of ways we demonstrate our corruptibility. In other words, our failure to be truly human, our failure to be the people of strong character who can relate to God and pursue and partner with him in accomplishing his purposes because of what he has done for us. And uh, again, this is not something we do on our own, but it is a gift from God, a, a capacity given to us as a gift from God by virtue of what Jesus has done and the giving of his spirit in our lives. Uh, because God is building his church. That's what he wants to do. It's, it's more than just about us. Um, these things are road signs or pathways leading away from what God wants to do. These do not build the church. These tear at our lives. They tear at human community. And, where, and wherever they have, uh, we ha you have problems. And Paul's saying, these lead away from God's future. These lead away from what God wants to do. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And this is not an exhaustive list, but you get the picture, you get the idea. The stuff that's going on in the culture around us that serves the self and is a demonstration of the corruptibility and the defects of human beings that need to be overcome by work of the, the work of Christ and his spirit in our lives. And then that we begin to rebuild and uh, be renewed with our, uh, in our partnership with him. Um, those are the things that lead to God's future, the in kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is present here and now in, in Jesus and the work of his spirit in us, and, but it's ultimately going to be consummated in the renewal of heaven and earth when it fully arrives. Um, we need to head towards that future, and that future does not belong to those who are driven by and given to these things as the virtues. These aren't virtues at all. These are things that naturally occur when people do their own thing. So one of the ways to determine whether action and behavior and whatnot, you know, are those things that people just naturally do and you see them in most every human society. And if you do, and they're so commonplace, it's very likely it's because they're not virtues, they're vices. And they hold people in its grip and they enslave people and, and prevent them from becoming what God wants them to be in Christ and being participants and pointing towards God's future. And uh, they, they, they anchor people back or they prevent um, people from entering the kingdom um, or fully entering it even in, uh, in, in the sense of uh, these just don't go with the kingdom life. They don't go with the life of the future that God has for his world. He goes on to say, but the fruit of the spirit, um, the fruit of the Spirit, notice that's singular, it's not plural, there's not fruits, it's fruit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. There's no restriction on those things. There's no need to restrict those things. Those are the things that the law, and the law here I think he is mainly referring to 
the, the, the charter that Israel received that said, this is the way of life of my people. Um, uh, you know, choose before you life and death. This is the way of life. Um, you know, in, we see in Moses, but uh, it can't produce it um, because of the flesh. The flesh is corruptible. And so what is needed is the work of the spirit to come and to renew us and to recreate us. And Jesus has made that possible. And now there are no restrictions on that. There's, this is what the law always wanted to do and says, yeah, that's what I wanted to produce. But, but I couldn't because I was dealing with flesh. I was dealing with corruptibility. Change the corruptibility by work of Christ and his spirit, and you change the traje trajectory and the ability to pursue virtues rather than vices or be remained in, you know, trapped in vices. And so he goes on and says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, that's pointing back to what we were talking about last week, being in Christ, having our, front, our, our new identity that's wrapped up in him and intertwined with him and his work, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There's a lot of active verbs here. Uh, that are very, very important to note. We'll look at those in a second. The development of Christian character is the wise way in the middle. We often tend as human beings to try to simplify things into what are more like really more personality issues and matters of preference, but really don't build the church wisely. What some of us tend to rules and others of us tend to freedom and responsibility. And often we see this passage as one of those two things. Uh, you know, many of us are, are, are rule oriented. We want to rule for everything. That's the way that just shows that, you know, that's the way progress is and others for its, no, it's freedom, it's spontaneity. It's being able to do what, what, uh, what I feel like and what feels good and, and uh, what maybe go, goes along with the crowd. And often we're, um, we feel like a ping pong ball between those two tensions that you cannot build a Christian community out of that kind of a situation. Christian community is built out of people with, who are pursuing virtue and developing a deep inner character that regardless of their personality preferences will, will tend and gravitate towards the right decision or the right course of action, which often can be different in different situations out of in the same, with the same principle. It's inner character uh, that builds us and then builds the church and furthers its purpose. So that's what we need to pursue and be able to look beyond matters of preference or personality. Uh, it has to go deeper and to be, to have the life uh, and the nature of, of Christ uh, formed in us in the kind of character that these Christian virtues give us. Classic example right now, the mask issue. Um, we're asking all of you, and we set up protocols some weeks ago to, uh, when we gather together in these simple churches, to do some basic things, just to be, um, to think about in in a manner of love the good from. So that includes mask wearing, and that's now been mandated by the governor outside in public places, especially if you can't social distance, you got to wear a mask. So that's that rule has had to been reimposed on uh, society here because people are too are exercising their freedom, and that's tilting the scale in that direction, um, not sharing food with one another. Um, in your simple churches, you should be eating your own food and that with your family. Don't share that with one another. That's not a wise thing to do right now. Um, though it might be less risky, let's not have it at all out of love and deference to one another. And the mask wearing itself is always about not transmitting to someone else in case over the course of the week you come in contact with someone and have it yourself and don't know it and you know out of caution and prudence but out of strength of character that says you know what for me it's about serving others for me it's about thinking about others first more than myself whether i'm a rule-based person or i'm a freedom-based person spontaneous person the wise course in the middle says Let's do what everyone can participate in, and that's the way to build. So you know, we see this in our situation right now. Safety and security on the part of some and the wearing of masks by everyone in every situation. There's a rule. You just never break the rule. Others who always find a way around the rule and a loophole in it, you know, and, and, and that loophole gets bigger and bigger and bigger because it's more about my personality towards and, and, and bent towards individual freedom and personal expression. We see that debate going on, and it becomes political. 
Uh, it doesn't need, it should never be that way in the church because the route to um, the solution is always in the formation of Christian character and the pursuit of deeper things uh, that grow out of character and not out of imposed rules or inner impulses. Uh, we can't be driven by either one of those. We have to be driven by virtue and character. That's where you build community and individuals are built in order to build community. The Christian root is rooted in character and makes the wise decision that serves God's purpose and others. And talking about the fruit of the Spirit, to have one of them is to have them all. It's one fruit of many qualities. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the one fruit. These all go together. You can't specialize. Um, you have to have them all from start to finish because they all make up one fruit. They are all together qualities of the new life. So we need to develop fully in all of them and desire that. They're not automatic. Um, they are enabled by the Spirit with our intention to crucify that part of ourselves, which is a rebellion to God and leading away from his future. We have to make choices that lead us into where God is going in his purposes. Uh, Paul said, you know, you crucify the flesh. You, the, 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 the rooting in love is the first part of this. So love is the big one. We'll see that here in a minute as it's echoed in some other verses. That's the greatest and most enduring vir virtue. Love is, as one scholar puts, a language they speak in new heaven and new earth. And that's the language we're learning to speak now. And it ties everything together. But love is cultivated in the soil of self-control. Self-control is the last virtue to be produced, produced on that list. Self-control does not happen automatically. You don't get self-control all of a sudden. You develop self-control by making wise choices on a regular basis. Um, anybody who's dieted knows that. Anybody who's trained for um, athletics knows that. Anybody who's studied for a test knows that. It doesn't come automatically. It doesn't come the fruit of the spirit does not come automatically to us just simply by virtue of being followers of jesus christ we're invited into a process led by the spirit and established by the spirit initiated by the spirit that we work together with him in pursuing virtue and seeing it developed in the strength of character that comes with us self-control is something that we have responsibility for um, so important thing to note look again the fruit of the Spirit, one fruit, love, the chief of the virtues. It starts here. And then joy, peace. We could talk about every one of these on a Sunday. And uh, I encourage you to reflect on them and think about what each one of those means and their implications. What does it mean to have the character of gentleness as a virtue? Um, and then eventually self-control. And as I said, these are the kinds of things the law wanted to produce but couldn't because of our corruptible, corruptible flesh. That corruptible flesh has now been crucified with Jesus, and we're now risen to new life with him, where we've declared our loyalty to him, we've made that public in baptism, and now we're in a position to say, I want to become a person of strong uh, character in every way with these kinds of virtues guiding me um, and crucifying the flesh. These are decisions. The old ways of doing things, the old vices are going to come knocking on your door every day in a thousand different ways, and you have to say no to each and every one of them. You can't give in to any of them. Um, that's a struggle all of us will face, but you face less and less the more you say no and no. Um, so it's a daily thing that we have to do. Um, I liken it to, and I've used this analogy before, this is a picture I took, I think this morning, from our grape vines in the backyard. I've always loved growing grapes. We had them in Albania. I learned how to do that. Unfortunately, I don't produce the best grapes because of our climate here, but I do it anyway, mainly just it makes me feel good, and I like uh, the look of them. And uh, the grapes right now, um, think about this. Um, you don't go to Home Depot and buy a grapevine and plop it in the ground and then expect to come back a few months later and you know, have grapes ready to press into wine or, you know, eat at the table. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, it goes into the ground, but then there are all sorts of things that have to be done at certain times. Uh, pruning, uh, removing some of the leaves, uh, putting some uh, um, fungicide on them, um, keeping the birds away, uh, 
uh, keeping the weeds out, mowing underneath it. There are a number of things, watering if it gets too dry, making sure the sun is, is, is hitting. You normally have to put the, the leaves on the left side of the vine I remove so that the morning sun gets them and dries out the dew from the evening. That's what leads them to them rotting. So you gotta, you gotta know that stuff and you gotta do it at the right time. Otherwise the whole crop is lost. You miss any of those things and there will be no crop at the end of the year. And a farmer would tell you this about a number of other things. So it's just a good analogy to what it means to, uh, to, 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 to be a vine, you know, and be, be connected to the root of Jesus. Um, but to know that these things are things that we need to be actively involved in together with the help of the Spirit in order to produce the kind of fruit in our lives that points to what God, who God is and what he's doing in the world and uh, helping others to do that. The Colossians passage, we talked about the first 11 last week, but I thought I'd bring it up here again. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you were a Jew or a Gentile circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So that's our common identity. And because of that, then, put on. That's something we do. You're responsible for this, Paul says. Put on, like a pair of clothes, like a set of clothes, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, some of the similar kinds of things that we saw in the fruit of the Spirit. And above all these things, put on love. There's the chief virtue again. Love, a, 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 a fundamental core virtue that says, it's not about me, it's about giving to others. It's about the well-being of others. If there's someone else out there, namely God himself, who will take care of me, I don't need to do that. I am free and I am able then to think about the needs of others um, and, you know, die to self and live to God. That's what that's talking about. Put that on. That's the core virtue needed alongside these other supporting virtues that will build Christ church. Everything bound together in perfect harmony. So the Didache that builds the church. Um, we looked at last week, the putting off the old self and putting on the new. We have a new identity. Now this week, we have a new life of virtues set before us that we are to pursue in partnership with the Spirit. Uh, it, it's not automatic, and it's not just us, and it's not just the Spirit. It's a, it's a working together because Christ wants us all participating with him and with one another in building his church. Um, I'll point out to you another resource that's good. This is a book called After You Believe. I went to a lecture regarding this book several years ago, and an author that I quote to you often, N.T. Wright, and I'll give an apologetic for that because um, I so often quote from him because he uh, is very much in the line of thinking and the kinds of things that we're talking about with first principles and with building the church-based training, as well as the Bible project kinds of things, biblical theology, letting the story of the Bible and the New Testament in particular shape our ideas and our thinking and our acting in these things. And that's a, um, there aren't many authors out there doing this in a comprehensive way. Hence, he's written almost a hundred books because uh, these ideas, uh, there's such a lack of them out there that he has many, many things that he can address. So that's one of the reasons you often hear from that, because it's very much in line with some of the other things that we often draw from um, as well. But that's a wonderful book. And uh, with a couple minutes here, I'll uh, read, um, perhaps read one of these quotes here that I had noted for you. I can't read them all, but um, I can speak more about it if anybody is uh, interesting, interested about it. Um, the key is this, the fruit of the spirit does not grow automatically. The nine varieties of fruit do not suddenly appear just because someone has believed in Jesus, has prayed for God's spirit, and has then sat back and waited for fruit to arrive. Oh, there will, may well be strong and sudden initial signs that fruit is on the way. Many new Christians, particularly when a sudden conversion has meant a dramatic turning away from a lifestyle full of the works of the flesh, report their own astonishment at the desire that springs up within, within, them, within them to love, to forgive, to be gentle, to be pure. And maybe many of you have experienced that. Where, they ask, has this all come from? It didn't used to be like this. This is a wonderful thing. A sure sign of the Spirit is working. But it doesn't mean it's all downhill from there or you go on autopilot. These are the blossoms 
to get the fruit, you have to learn to be a gardener. You have to discover how to tend and prune, how to irrigate the field, how to keep birds and squirrels away. You have to watch for blight and mold, cut away ivy and other parasites that suck the life out of the tree and make sure the young trunk could stand firm in strong winds. Only then will the fruit appear. Again, and he talks about the fact that because self-control is in that list that Paul lists of the virtues, it means we do have a responsibility in it. And the further, when he says that we have to crucify the flesh, that's something that we're responsible for. Um, just as we talk about in our first principles about being renewing our minds. It's, it's very much in light of this thing, that our mind is a key part of this in order to be transformed by the spirit. Um, we do the renewing. God does the transforming, um, and there's a there's a partnership and a commingling in that way. So, let me close it with this: um, just some things to think about and for habits and growing in virtue. You have to want this and desire it above all else as an individual. Do you want to be a person of strong character and virtue? You need to want that. It is what Jesus wants for you. So that's the first thing. Know the goal. Your life. Pursue the goal of a life of fully formed character uh, in the manner which we've been talking about here. Pour your energies and devote your time and resources to pursue this across a lifetime. It means you'll say yes to some things and no to some other things. Are they helping you grow in Christian character and virtue? Pursue those. Are they limiting that or even pointing away from that? Throw them off. Avoid them be thoughtful about them, ask for advice about those things. The other thing then, take it a step at a time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day, they say. Christian character and virtue is not built in a day. It is built over a lifetime. Like that pilot who landed in the Hudson, he made a million decisions before he made that million and one decision that saved all those people's lives. It had to have all of that in order for this to happen. The life of Christian virtue and character is like that. Enjoy thinking about this, and uh, I hope you have a good time talking about it in your simple churches on Sunday. So God bless you in the days ahead, and um, look forward to seeing you this uh, this coming weekend.